We have uh, about uh, roughly 60 minutes for the panel, and I'd like to kick off uh, the panel with, by inviting Professor Jacob John to talk about the research, prior, the, the research that uh, has been done in Muzaffarpur and other areas, and then what we have learned from the same. Professor Jacob John, please. Moderator uh, Bhatnagar and my co-panelists and friends and colleagues. This topic was given to me by the organizers. Um, Musafarpur case study. Let me tell you that the goal of all research in modern medicine, I'm not talking about research in science behind medicine, but in medicine is to prevent disease and protect life. Um, in Musafarpur, since 1980s, annual recurring outbreaks of an acute brain disease of children with very high case fatality, 60 to 80 percent, was known since 1980s. Doctors equated outbreak with infection. All outbreaks need not be infection. Acute infectious, therefore, brain disease means encephalitis. Assumption. An encephalitis outbreak can only be caused by Japanese encephalitis virus. So when Japanese encephalitis was ruled out in 1995, the etiology remained a mystery, and it was called a mystery virus May, June, July are also the lychee harvesting season in Musafarpur. Musafarpur is the best known uh, district in India uh, cultivating lychee. Lychee trees are vegetatively propagated, one clone flowering, flowering and fruiting simultaneously. Fruits in bunches are saleable. Stray fruits falling to the ground is of no commercial value. Anybody can collect them, children can collect them and hold them and share with friends anytime. So in 2013, at, uh, in, invited by the state uh, officers, because of my virology background, this is the acute viral encephalitis. That's why they call me. Um, I was introduced as professor of pediatrics, so that's another another specialty that I have, pediatrics. So, I was uh, surprised to know that there was no case definition. So I used clinical data to make one. Sudden onset without prodrome is not encephalitis. Encephalitis has a prodrome. A day, two days, three days, four days, when the virus multiplies in the body, fever and not feeling well, headache, etc., etc., and then only the encephalitic phase. Sudden onset without prodrome, not encephalitis, clinically. So I checked the CSF data in charts when it was done. I mean, not every patient has uh, lumbar puncture done because it is 
Everybody knows it is acute viral encephalitis of unknown etiology. Normal cell count, normal protein, but low glucose. That is not like encephalitis. All children, this had been missed totally by everybody. All children started sim signs and symptoms between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. Now, no virus keeps a clock. Hypoglycemia is expected. Low CSF glucose had been shown. People had observed hypoglycemia in these children, but 5% dex glucose given did not cure them. So hypoglycemia was not given too much uh, importance. So I made a diagnosis of hypoglycemic encephalopathy. Not simply hypoglycemia, but hypoglycemic encephalopathy. Everybody knew that all case children are stunted and or wasted. And all have easy access to lychee fruits. Because it's a, you know, the whole district is uh, full of lychee orchards. As a pediatrician, I knew of two causes of hypoglycemic encephalopathy. One is inborn error of metabolism. Outbreak cannot happen. It's an extremely uncommon, sporadic. Jamaican vomiting syndrome is a hypoglycemic encephalopathy associated with aki fruit. Google search, aki and lychee belong to one plant family, Sapindaceae. Hey, that's getting very interesting. Aki has methylene cyclopropyl alanine that blocks fatty acid oxidation, which is related to neoglucogenesis, which means undernourished children early in the morning go into hypoglycemia. Neoglucogenesis is kicked in. Fatty acid oxidation. That is blocked by MCPA, so you have backup molecules that go to the brain, they're, they're toxic. Lychee seeds had been shown to contain an analog methylene cyclopropyl glycine. So, as a detective, you see all these pieces coming together, are they all connected? So what's the logical next step? as an epidemiologist, make a hypothesis, lychee-associated hypoglycemic encephalopathy. Confirmed with studies, prospective case series in the next year, and if this is hypoglycemic encephalopathy due to blocked Neoglucogenesis, 5% glucose will not cure it. You need 20% glucose or at least 10% glucose. Why? Because you have to stimulate insulin production to turn off neoglucogenesis and fatty acid oxidation to prevent accumulation, further accumulation of the brain cell toxic metabolic intermediate. Lychee fruit pulp was shown by my friend in uh, Lucknow, Dr. Mukul Das, has MCPG. Now, it turns out that these children, most of these, all the sick children, or most of the sick children that we could assess had gone to bed fairly early. Families never woke the child up, never fed the night meal. So the fasting period was more than usual. So undernourished, prolonged fasting, hypoglycemia, neoglucogenesis. There you have lychee connection. And this has been reconfirmed completely with greater, in greater detail by CDC working with NCDC scientists, 53 of them scientists working together. I had three people working together with me, one local pediatrician and the guy in Lucknow. 
so here it is hypoglycemic encephalopathy lichy associated with three etiological factors under nutrition it cannot be easily corrected this is bihar prolonged fasting simple solution when families gave a night meal before the children were allowed to sleep the disease totally disappeared 2014 15 two and five cases anyway here it is not all outbreaks are infectious diseases and the primary goal of a researcher in an outbreak is how to save lives and stop mortality thank you very much thank you very much sir i think you really emphasized the need for research and a systematic uh, approach to that especially during outbreaks when we we have etiologies floating around and the need for systematically looking into what could be the cause connecting the dots identifying patterns and then using that as evidence to provide the control measures well moving on from muzaffarpur to <coughs> gorakhpur uh, uh now invite uh, professor ravi to talk about his experiences from in establishing a laboratory based surveillance for aes in india so we get to hear about the laboratory perspective of an outbreak investigation something that's uh, not evenly distributed across the country and where a lot of outbreak investigations actually tend to lack a laboratory uh, rigor so over to dr ravi please thank you tarun and before i start let me thank the organizers and also extend felicitations to nie on completing 20 years continue the great work you're doing we all have benefited from your work um i'm going to talk to you about our experience for the last 5 years on a large scale surveillance that we set up in three states this setting up the surveillance resulted in improved diagnosis clinical management and change in policy this was funded by cdc through a cooperative agreement i think all of us know what acute encephalitis syndrome is i won't go into the definition since it's a syndrome multiple causes are attributed to it in india various publications have indicated arboviruses measles mumps bacterial meningitis masquerading as and of course sporadic cases of herpes and vzd we continue to occur globally 50% of en- acute encephalitis syndrome etiology is not possible for a variety of reasons i won't go into it and one should also keep the other causes of aes elegantly put forward by professor jacob john who was my mentor autoimmune disease autoimmune encephalitis is coming up now since we have the technology at nimhans we see about 10% of auto uh, encephalitis due to autoimmune metabolic which professor john talks and of course there are other toxic encephalopathies if you look at the history of encephalitis its outbreaks in india right from mid 70s when large outbreaks occurred most of the outbreaks were attributed to japanese encephalitis because 20 to 30% of cases we were able to prove japanese encephalitis and in 2005 immunization was introduced immunization works if it is given the incidence of japanese encephalitis came down from 30% to about 10 to 12% so at on this background cdc asked us to find out what are the remaining 80 cases 80 to 90% of cases so we set up systematic surveillance as professor john said perception in india even among health professionals is that aes is equal to japanese encephalitis it can't be anything else what did we do we did six things we engaged with stakeholders primarily state health departments nbbdcp asked them to identify sites then we finalized a test- testing strategy because we wanted to find out other etiologies so we evolved an algorithm we built laboratory capacity in all the sites by training them every year and administering a proficiency panel 
Then we establish a sample transport mechanism, which was the key link, because patients can't go to referral laboratories, so samples have to move, and we streamline data collection using a uh, tool. We worked in three states, Uttar Pradesh, Assam, and West Bengal. We started with six sites in 2014, rapidly expanded to 18 sites, and these sites were identified by states. And the states also wanted us to build capacity for non-JE testing in a referral lab. For Uttar Pradesh, it was King George Medical University. For Assam, it's a wide state, so they wanted two, one at Dibrugar and Gavati, and in Calcutta, the School of Tropical Medicine. Engaging with clinicians, public health people, we asked them to identify what etiologies should we test for. They gave a huge laundry list. We pruned down to something like eight to ten organisms which are known to cause outbreaks. The vector-borne disease surveillance program, which existed from 2005, tested only for Japanese encephalitis. There are only two outputs in that surveillance. Acute encephalitis syndrome due to Japanese encephalitis. If it is negative, it was called unknown. Now, we layered on the same surveillance additional testing. We had two strategies, one for antibody-based tests using serum samples, which included dengue, chikungunya, leptospira, scrub typhus, and molecular testing for CSF, which included herpes, entero, and Zika was given as a gift by CDC, so we also threw in Zika. So our outputs were 11, AES JE, AES Dengue, AES Scrub, and so on. This is the uh, number of patients we enrolled, 15,000 in five years. Half of them, 60% of them were children, 58% were male. Our specimen collection really was a big success, I must say, because we placed one, one laboratory coordinator in every site. In 75%, we had CSF. Earlier, it used to be 30 to 40%. This is the summary. Among the 14,096 patients overall, we had etiology in about 48%. If you look at the antibody-based tests, the commonest we identified was Japanese encephalitis. This was more so in Assam, and Assam contributed to the main burden in our study. Dengue was about 5%. Scrub typhus was 14%. West Nile, 1%. Leptospira, 2%. Chikungunya 5%. Lepto and chikungunya, I must say, we added into the testing algorithm only in 2017. And in the nucleic acid side, we were able to identify bacterial meningitis pathogens contributing to about 2%, herpes, and we really called the bluff on enteroviruses, which people used to say cause large outbreaks. Mind you, this does not include 8% of patients who had multiple tests positive. Multiple tests does not mean tests are bad. Multiple tests only means that we don't know which one is the culprit, because all of them occur in the post-monsoon season. To put the right context, among, during the same period, NVBTCP recorded 37,500 cases. Of this, we had sampled 15,000, so it's a significant proportion. In overall, we had etiology close to 50%, but JE, scrub, and dengue accounted for 73% of all etiologies. So we changed the strategy by testing this uh, at the district itself instead of the referral lab. So this is the, the platform we developed as an Android application, which we have handed over to the states. Overall, the outcomes of the project increased by threefold etiology, 20% were treatable causes we identified. Strup typhus was a major pathogen that resulted in policy change by 
the state health secretaries issuing circulars for empirical treatment of AES after specimen is collected using doxycycline and erythromycin. The huge data set we provided enabled ICMR and NVBDCP to change the testing strategy. Very rarely in life you get a chance to change policy and we were lucky. The UP government has taken this enhanced surveillance and incorporated into their routine. We partnered with NIE, CDC, WHO and Manipal to identify risk factors for scrub typhus. This is published. I won't go into the details. Basically, the risk factors identified for scrub typhus in children in Gorakhpur and Devriya were open air defecation, storing firewood in the house, playing in the fields, and the house located in the field and not the main village. We also learned from Dr. Arun Kumar that in the acute febrile illness surveillance he carried out, he had, we had common pathogens. So we did a pilot in one PHC in Devriya district where we simultaneously overlapped both surveillances. We used rapid tests which uh, we had validated and what we found there were the patterns between the PHC and the district hospitals were similar. People in the PHC who were diagnosed but did not take treatment landed up a week later with encephalitis and to cut a short story by introducing AFI surveillance, what is in red there, we showed 50% reduction of AES because of AFI surveillance. Of course, this is a pilot, this needs to be validated further. Our project was shortlisted as one of the three for BMJ South Asia Awards, and we were privileged for that. There are a lot, large number of people who worked. I would like to acknowledge them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. I guess for unraveling any mystery, we need the lab. Right? So that lot of so instead of calling mystery, like we need these the tools of the lab to actually uh, demystify what we call as mystery diseases and, uh, and we learn from that. And a really good example of going from the community to the bench to policy and bringing it back to the community and how uh, it's essential for a very good lab support to be able to do that. So moving on, so we've, we've traveled to Bihar and then Uttar Pradesh, so let's come down. Down south, we move to Kerala now, where uh, we'll hear from Dr. Sugnan about the public health response and setting up of the surveillance uh, during the Nipah outbreak in the 2018 and 19 uh, outbreaks in Kerala. Dr. Tarun, <coughs> other panelists and colleagues. Uh, the outbreak of Nipah that happened in Kerala in May 2018 is very well known and the public health response by the health services has been acclaimed as a success story. I understand that a lot of, a lot about this has already been talked about here, particularly Dr. Harishankar, so I will not go into the details. I just want to flag a few observations which I have regarding the public health response during that period. As we all know, the, 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 the first, the, how, the, how the story unfolded, for unfolded, the index case was a 23-year-old 20, male who had a short illness for, of about five days duration between 1st and May, 1st and 5th of May, and expired on 5th of May. This, this uh, triggered an investigation by the uh, health services, uh, under the IDSP. The field, field level investigators uh, went to the place, investigated and filed a report. But this did not trigger any systematic investigation. And the story was soon forgotten. And the next, next phase started when a group of physicians in, in a private hospital noticed a cluster of cases of encephalitis in the, house of the, in the household of the index case. And they had the access to a VRDL in Mangalore and the samples were tested and they gave a provisional diagnosis of uh, Nipah 
Nipah virus infection, which rank, which resulted in uh, <coughs> public health action by the state health services. This the diagnosis was confirmed on 20th May by NAV Pune. So the health system and the government immediately responded. Initi initially, the response was more or less intuitive, not with any specific uh, objectives and clear protocol. But soon, probably based on the Ebola virus control protocols, they developed their own uh, protocols and then started operating in a very systematic manner. So the organizational hierarchy, it was taken up as a state level program, the NIPA control activities, with Chief Minister himself super being the overall supervisor and supported by three other ministers and the additional chief secretary as the um, as a immediate uh, controller of everything and the other partners were the district administration of code code the dhs and the government medical college code code and an emergency operation center was because i don't go into f f minor details just to list out the emergency operation center uh, was created which uh, coordinated almost all activities of NIPA control, control program. So it included infrastructure procurement and logistics, training, case definition and development of protocols, burial cremation guidelines, contact tracing and home quarantine, <coughs> and establishing and maintaining a call center for the public, daily, act daily activity review and media interaction, and license with researchers. So, these are all little bit details about each of these each of these tasks and one of the major the most important activity was tracing and monitoring the contacts and maintaining the contacts so this was initiated soon after the navy etiology was not known and the pro protocol was developed based on ebola co contact tracing protocol but the only difference was that a case here did not was not confined to a NIPA, confirmed NIPA case, but they also listed all encephalitis and ARDS, ARDS death cases during that period and uh, of unknown etiology, and this was added to the list of cases. So contacts were defined with respect to either a NIPA case or an unknown case, uh, a death due to um, encephalitis of, or ARDS of unknown etiology. So the list of contacts was prepared and expanded daily and the protocol was home quarantine for 21 days for asymptomatic contacts and the, the health status was monitored through telephone calls and by field staff and there's a call center which also which which received information about the about people becoming symptomatic for that was a first reporting point and symptomatics were transferred to the isolation facility. An isolation facility was created in Government Medical College, Code Code. A 100-room uh, block was converted into isolation facility, which had three levels, level 1, 2, and 3. Suspects were admitted to level 1. When they were, uh, and when they were a confirmed case, they were in the highest level of isolation, level 3. And this definition of a contact was based on six criteria, which was exactly as the Ebola uh, contact tracing protocol, except that a case here means a death due to, in addition to NIPA case, confirmed NIPA case, a death due to a, uh, encephalitis or ARDS of unknown etiology. So the criteria were sleeping or eating in the same household as a case, physical contact with a case, contact with the dead body during funeral, or contact with body fluids, including excreta or clothes or if a person is a, a child breastfed by a confirmed case of confirmed case either nipa or encephalitis or ARDS case so this this is a the algorithm used for contact management the salient point i don't, I, will, I will not try to describe everything the salient point is that the call center received the first information about a person becomes sim becoming symptomatic so immediately the MO of the concerned PHC was notified, the ambulance service was notified, and the isolation facility was notified. The MO counseled the relatives of the, um, the, the, the patient, and one major important thing is that when the patient is being transported to the isolation facility, he was not to be accompanied by anybody. He will be looked after in the ambulance. And they, the, 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 the ambulance 
service, which was manned by a group of voluntary ambulance drivers, they took the patient to the tagging area of the isolation facility. From the tagging area, it, he was admitted. He will be admitted to the uh, to the uh, to level one, and samples will be tested. And if he if he tests positive, he will be transferred to level three, and then the, his contacts will be identified and added to the list. If he is symptomatic and negative, he will be repeatedly test, tested, and if he becomes positive any time, he will be shifted to level three. Otherwise, if the if he becomes symptom free and the laboratory tests are negative, he will be discharged with the advice for home isolation for 21 days. This is the algorithm. The transportation of patients had a specific protocol which included uh, counseling, pre-transportation counseling by MO and nobody to accompany the patient and then after transporting the disinfection of the ambulance. So this is the size of the contact list by day. So at the peak of that period, in the second week of June, it had reached about 2,500. And if you look at the composition of the contacts, 45% of the contacts were health workers and the remaining 55 household or community contacts. In addition to this, the, this is a major operation, contact tracing and monitoring. The other, other uh, activities of uh, NIPA control program included mental health support and then people are asked to be in home isolation and they were provided free ration and financial support in some cases. And the laboratory diagnosis was, was by two laboratories. One is a VRDL in Mangalore, which gave the provisional result within 24 hours and always confirmed by uh, ICMR and AV Pune. Uh, and the, and the, the test used for diagnosis was real-time reverse transcript test PCR targeting, targeting the nuclear capsid gene of NIV. Antiviral therapy with ribavirin was uh, tested in a series of 12 cases which was, uh, that, that were treated in the emergency room. It seems that ribavirin therapy probably could have, might have reduced the mortality from 100% to 66.7%, but that was not statistically significant. And this is the next two, two slides, I'll just show the, how the outbreak behaved. So this is the epic curve of the 18 cases, which included all confirmed cases and the index case, which was not confirmed. So the first red one is a index case, which we know is due to spillover from its animal carrier, most probably bats. And the yellow ones are the second generation cases who contracted the infection from the index case. And the two green ones are the third generation cases who contracted from the first generation cases. If you look at the, how the transmission has happened in these cases, the first one of course was a spillover from animal. And out of the remaining 17 patients, 15 had contracted the infection from hospitals or nosocomial infection. There are only two patients who contracted the infection from community. So this is a very hypothetical thing. If you see that the index case, after he obtained the, or acquired the infection from animal, from bat, he transmitted to 15 individuals. If it had it progressed in the same, with the same force, in the next generation should have been 225. I know the outbreaks might not behave in that way, but I wonder, what I wanted to say is that probably that difference, but in, in this case, the second generation was 15 cases, the third generation was two cases, and they died out. Down. So the, the difference between the, that red polygon and the green polygon, probably by part of it, is attributable to the, the, the response by the public health system. But how much, we cannot say. And I just want to conclude by uh, listing out some of the positives. The, the approach was the, the, the political leadership showed a lot of uh, professionalism. They left all technical and public health decisions to professionals and they focused on mobilizing resources and, uh, and reassuring people. And the senior uh, bureaucrats, they led from the front. They acted as an interface between the political leadership and the scientific and public health community. And the administration was on site. The uh, con uh, command and control was right there in the place of the outbreak, which 
at least uh, played two, had two important impacts. One is that the, the leadership was very visible to the people who were affected. Second thing is that the, 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 the people who were manage, managing had the opportunity to actually see the ground reality. And the, uh, and the third one was, and the fourth one was transparency in communications. So the media was briefed every day and everything was transparent. The situation was uh, communicated to the people through media and the media was taken as a partner in the whole operation. And the political leadership did not shy away from in accepting the reality that a grave public health exigency has happened in that area. And there is a very close and uh, close partnership with voluntary groups, people's groups, uh, and even private sector. And the empathy and the proactive actions of healthcare workers and volunteers was very important. In, in that situation. An example is the, the, the voluntary group of ambulance drivers and, and a voluntary group called um, Compassionate Calicut, which took up the, the whole task of uh, maintaining and creating and maintaining the contact list and monitoring the contacts. So where the system performed, once the outbreak was detected and the etiology was known, the response was quick. The response used used an integrated approach with centralized command and control. Almost all aspects of epidemic where intervention was possible were addressed, which include control tracing and quarantine, isolation of patients and barrier nursing, risk mitigation during patient transportation and funeral, frequent and transport in, uh, tra transparent communication of risk and outbreak status, measures of risk reduction among healthcare workers, and effective tra tra partnership with voluntary groups and private sector. The index case transmitted the infection to at least 15 percent, but the outbreak did not progress with the same force for them. Once the intervention was initiated, the outbreak was contained. But what are the possible, what are the pitfalls or limitations and of the system, and where there are scopes for improvement? The outbreak was detected only when a cluster of second generation case started to appear. The first, the index case, though it. In, it triggered an investigation locally, it, it was not sustained. Almost all the exposure events that led to transmission of infection occurred before the public health system started to respond. Means it happened before the, uh, when the, actually when the patient, the index case, uh, attended two, two, three hospitals in Parambra and Koyikot. 13 of the 15 cases who acquired the infection from the index case contracted the infection between 3rd and 5th of May when the index case attended hospital with severe illness. The system was not capable of preventing transmission of infection at that stage. When the index case died with encephalitis and IRDS of unknown etiology, investigation as per the IDSP protocol was conducted locally and a report was filed to IDSP. The system did not pick up that signal. The local investigations conducted uh, concluded prematurely, and hence the occurrence of the cluster of cases in the household was not detected by the, by the system, but by a group of astute physicians in a private hospital. When the index case attended the, uh, the tertiary care hospital, the practices there were not adequate to prevent nosocomial transmission of infection. So these are the areas which could be improved. A lot has been done since Nipah outbreak, when the Coronavirus outbreak now started. Many of these things have been addressed, and the system is much improved system now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subman. I think his presentation clearly underlines uh, the need. Uh, it's, I mean, the response during the NEPA outbreak is, is actually a, a very good case study for us to understand how resource intensive the response is so do we does do our systems have those resources available both in terms of manpower as well as in terms of material and the cap capacity of the labs etc uh, it also undergoes underscores uh, the issue of timeliness uh, on one hand we say it was timely so it did not progress further but we also know that it could have been curtailed m a bit earlier if the responses were set up earlier. There's also a lot to learn about intersectoral collaboration and coordination that was set up 
amongst various departments, not just the health sector, but the non-health sector, which played a very crucial role, especially in contact tracings and managements and the role of community in all of this. And finally, it underscores uh, the synergy that was there between the, the political leadership uh, and the, 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 te the technical expertise that was available, which was really critical to an effective response. So uh, really, uh, we, we, we have a lot of publications, and I'm sure all of us can actually learn a lot from what can, how it, it can be done well, and also learn how it could be improved further. So thank you, Dr. Sugun. Uh, we have another panelist who's not here with us, and that is uh, Dr. R. Chandini. She was at the forefront of uh, management of the cases uh, during the Nipah outbreaks. She's a professor of medicine and head of department of the emergency medicine at Government Medical College, Kodi Code. And uh, subsequent to the uh, Nipah outbreak and recogn her recognizing her efforts during that, she received the best doctor award in Medi modern medicine in medical education sector in 2018 from the government of Kerala and the best teacher award in 2019 in the medical stream from Kerala University of Health Sciences. We have a uh, video recorded message from her because uh, for some personal reasons she could not join us and she'll be talk talking to us about the infection control practices and the, the hospital setup uh, that helped to uh, respond to the Nipah outbreak in 2018. Can we have the video please? Respected senior colleagues and dear friends, I'm thankful to the organizing committee for giving me this invitation to be part of this panel discussion. And I feel proud and honored to be part of this program. I'll be presenting upon the infection prevention and control, our experiences during the outbreak of Nipah 2018 and 2019. And we will be sharing the experiences of establishing isolation facilities during Nipah and case management and measures taken to improve infection prevention and control during the outbreak. Our place, Kori Court, as we all know, it has got a of, lot of socio-cultural and religious meetings happening every day. And our institution, it is primarily catering to the needs of medicine, surgery and orthopedic problems, is a busy tertiary care center. And it has got an average ED turnover of about 500 to 800 patients per day with a huge load managed every day and it is always very much crowded. And to this background, we were informed that there is a possible zoonotic outbreak. Happened on 17 May 2018. Why? Because three family members were admitted in a private hospital. And at the same time, we were having one patient, 32-year-old female with ARDS and myocarditis. And immediately the system was alerted because of the family clustering. And on 18th, the samples were tested in Manipal Center for Virology and Research Institute. And we were told, or we were got the information that there is a dangerous virus in three patients. And the samples were tested in National Institute of Virology. And the confirmation and the test results was uh, informed that it is Nipah virus infection and the outbreak was officially declared in Kerala and looking back there was a primary case that is the real, uh, son of the same family one member from the same family was admitted in our own hospital he came in the morning and he was having features of viral encephalitis and he was in the busy casualty area and then he had to move to the CT area and he was uh, tried for CT many times because patient was very restless and there was a lot of exposure with this patient for many, many people, uh, patients as well as relatives at that point of time. And viral encephalitis is not an unusual diagnosis because as we know, world over, we cannot give the final uh, confirmatory etiological diagnosis in most of the situations and this is happening in our place also. But now it became very, very important because of the family clustering of the problem. And the response, the response of Nipah virus infection was instantaneous at hospital level as well as at public health level. 
and isolation facility, ventilator care, round-the-clock control room, that is the NIPA cell, was constituted on the same date when it was informed something is going to happen and all of these patients are going to come with ARDS and they need to get appropriate treatment. Infection control practice in healthcare facility is the key to reduce risk for further spread of patients, caregivers and healthcare workers. This was told on day one itself. And those, whatever training we had that was demonstrated in that meeting itself about how to use PPE and how to do proper infection control practices and seven steps to fight NIV in our hospital that was implemented immediately was maintain strict infection control practice, ensure proper use of PPE by all healthcare workers, follow appropriate housekeeping processes, uh, housekeeping practices, stressing on infection control, and monitor staff health. Don't allow six people at work and implement six visitor policy. Visitors were, in fact, not allowed to the hospital at all at that point of time. Ensure safe collection and handling of samples and transportation and disease handling, handling of the disease. That was also a major challenge. That was a big trauma at that point of time because we were not allowing them to say goodbye to their beloved ones. That was a great period of trauma for all of us when we treat a patient. And this is how the fever trials was managed. If a patient comes to the ED and patient comes for fever, patient will go straight away to the fever triage and only the other patients were allowed into the usual ED and they were not allowed to the uh, fever emergency department area. So in the fever triage what we did was we will have the case definition of NIV, Nipah virus infection and if the case definition satisfies Nipah, the patient will be sent to the isolation facility and if the patient is seriously ill, patient will be moving to the ICU and if the patient is not very seriously ill, patient will be kept in the isolation ward. And the test done was real-time PCR from blood, urine or throat swab and CSF if available. And this was quickly transformed isolation facility. There were two buildings adjacent and one was managed as the fever triage area and the other was converted into isolation ward with the critical care area rooms available for seriously ill patients and in the uh, there were rooms for less serious patients where for uh, testing and confirmation and if the patient is negative they were able to move out of the isolation facility so single room facility was provided and isolation facility was testing upon the dawning and doffing area dawning there were video played to see that the people do it correctly, they were mirror kept and there were people supervising them so they will helping them to do it correctly and in the doffing area they were reassured and told how to do it so that this will not be transmitted to the healthcare worker and there were no visitors that was the policy at that point of time and people were really scared to come to that area also and only the people working there and the staff number was very much reduced and this is a training and it was happening daily and continuously and there were daily activity reviews and everyone in the hospital were trained and including those people, ambulance drivers, auto rickshaw drivers and hospital staff, uh, office staff, everyone was trained apart from the healthcare workers. And in Kori Code, our outbreak, we had one primary case, 18 confirmed and four probable cases. Clinical presentations were encephalitis and ARDS. And we also saw patients with myocarditis in this outbreak. Two survivors, different spectrum. One patient had myocarditis, encephalitis, ARDS with a dystotomia and the second patient had the flu-like illness. If a patient comes with contact and symptoms at hospital contacts, including healthcare workers, caregivers, those attended the funeral rituals, admitted in the isolation facility and sent home if tested negative for Nipah and symptom-free or tested negative with a definite alternative diagnosis, but they will be there if the symptoms are persisting and repeat testing was done. Rule out other causes of fever. That was also an important stress at that point of time. Management, ensure personal safety, strict adherence to proper triaging and general measures, intense supportive care, no specific treatment was available and rebarbering was given to our patients on confirmation. These are the challenges the, were, we faced, early identification of suspect contacts with symptoms, previous hospital visits, safe transportation of contacts, early outbreak detection and diagnosis, turnaround time, that is what we wanted to get it reduced and it was done by the National Institute of Virology by the point of care test in the next outbreak. Implementing strict infection control practice, on-site capacity building was the key to success. Healthcare providers, sick day rules, if the patient is sick, it is not allowed in the healthcare facility. 
uniform standard of care for everyone, safe burial in a dignified manner, psychosocial problems, and this has to be addressed even for the staff as well as for the patients and the public and long-term follow-up of survivors. That was also very, very important. These are the psychosocial impacts, public distress, social media hype, stigma, funeral trauma, healthcare work distress, all this has to be addressed. And we came with the next outbreak in 2019, but there was luckily only one patient and we cannot call it an outbreak, but it was an, a challenge or test for the system how work good it was happening and we had the same process running and system properly alerted with training setting up isolation facility contact training and contact tracing and we had the point of care lab at that point of time so there is preparedness research and teamwork that is the key to success in Nipah outbreak infection and I've been trying to take you through what we did and it is not easy to express the whole thing in eight minutes or ten minutes, but I have tried to cover the essence to you in this presentation and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. We thank Dr. Chani and I think uh, healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, uh, the sta other staff working at hospitals, they are like our frontline soldiers and I think it, re the, it really emphasizes the need for infection control in hospital, not just to prevent infection in healthcare workers, but also preventing infection to the other people that are around in the hospital. So something that we, we learned from the Nipah outbreak. Uh, talking about response, one of their, so we have case managements, and we have various strategies for responding to outbreaks. And one of the very critical strategy is vaccination. Uh, and we are trying to search for a vaccine for coronavirus, uh, there's no vaccine, there's, we're trying to search for a vaccine for Nipah virus, uh, but we do have vaccines for a lot of diseases. And then uh, one of the examples that now I would like uh, Dr. Kiran to share with us is his experience uh, from the KFD vaccine campaign uh, in Karnataka. Over to Dr. Kiran. Thank you, sir, and thank you, NIV. Good afternoon, everyone. Casper Forest Disease, or KFD, as it's commonly known, was previously affecting only five districts of Karnataka. But after 2012, there was an outbreak in Goa, Maharashtra, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. And now five states are affected, and more than 12 districts in Karnataka are affected. For the long-term long protection prevention of the disease, vaccine is available. It's a formalin-inactivated tissue culture vaccine. It is given to the people who are living within five kilometer radius of any positive case or area reporting in a uh, monkey visera collector from that area reporting positive for KFDV or a tick pool collector from that area reporting positive for KF KFDV. Then the vaccination is conducted uh, for the people uh, who are living in that area in the five kilometer radius area. Uh, only the people, uh, children below six years old and pregnant women and those who are really sick, uh, they are not uh, given vaccine. Otherwise, vaccine is given in primary doses, two initial doses which are given one month apart, and first booster which is given six to eight months, six to nine months after the second dose. As the immunity provided by the vaccine is a short-lived one, uh, yearly boosters are required. And the route of administration is subcutaneous. Uh, adults are given one ml dose, and uh, children 7 to 14 years, 0 0.5 ml is given. We have been conducting this vaccination since 1990, but the response from the target population is, was not so great. And there were many challenges we encountered. Uh, when we started in 2016, when I joined this uh, KFD vaccination program, our target was only 90,000, but our achievement was used to be around like 25% uh, only. So there are many challenges we identified. Challenges at community level, challenges at uh, individual level, uh, challenges at institution level, and many issues with the, virus, with the vaccine also. Like at the community level, our target population was adult population, laborers, and those who lived in a very remote area, very hard to reach and difficult to reach population. So we targeted this adult population using the local administrators, local media, religious leaders, and political leaders. Usually these adult population are parents. When it comes to the health of their children, they care for them. But when it comes to the health of their own, they usually neglect it 
and vaccination, they really run away, and that too, an injectable vaccine means they're not so supportive. But with the help of these people, religious leaders, political leaders, and even some local motivated individuals, we tried to motivate it, uh, with, uh, with targeted IEC, we motivated them as much as possible. And then there was an issue of uh, working, uh, they, are, they were all workers, they are all uh, labor population. They used to leave their house by 9 o'clock in the morning, used to return only 6 o'clock in the evening. So we, what we did was, uh, even if they are coming to the, they, they were not willing to come to our sub-centers, they are not willing to come to our primary health centers for vaccination. So we thought, if they are not coming to us, let's go to them. So we went to the doorsteps, and the timings was beneficiary friendly only. As they were leaving their houses by 9 o'clock in the morning, we used to be at their doorstep by 6 o'clock in the morning. We used to vaccinate that population by 6 to 9, and then vaccinate the nearby school population also. And one more difficult thing was, uh, they were all uh, living in a very remote area or working in a very remote areas. So for, to counter this, we came up with uh, a refined micro-action plan that we kept on evolving in a way. So we had a very specific plan with a team of vaccinators, like a team for the, uh, designated for vaccination, where one vaccinator will be there, which will be either a staff nurse from nearby hospital or a and m and one ASHA of the area for mobilizing people, and one volunteer. For, uh, uh, for, for the documentation purpose. So in that way, we targeted them, we went to their house, vaccinated them from six to nine, and we kind of uh, improved our coverage in that area. And similarly, at uh, individual level, people were actually not appreciating the need or recognize the need for getting the vaccine. Because they didn't know a KFD outbreak is going on in that area. So what we did was, with the help of local media, we made sure that every case of KFD was reported in the next day newspaper. And even the uh, TV channels were employed. We employed social media also in this, because a lot of local uh, WhatsApp groups were there. So we were trying to uh, kind of circulate the information that KFD outbreak is going on in that area. And at the same time, we, have, we used the help of this uh, vehicle-mounted loudspeakers. Whichever area is reporting cases, in the five-kilometer radius of that area, with the help of local gram panchayats, we made sure that every second day there used to be a uh, miking saying that a KFD outbreak is going on. And specifically, we used to, with our uh, specific epidemiological investigation, we, we could usually point out this is the particular area which, is report, which harbors infected ticks and reporting cases. So we used to give information regarding that also. And there was a fear of adverse event following immunization. As this was a formalin inactivated tissue culture vaccine, obviously there was a burning sensation at the site of vaccine, which used to last for 45 seconds to 50, uh, 60 seconds only. But people, as they were reluctant, they were not willing to take vaccine, and they were complaining of a uh, uh, lot of uh, pain and other things, like uh, the falling off here and other, other, other uh, unsubstantiated things that were, uh, uh, that were not true. What, then what we did was, we employ this interpersonal communication skills using our ASHA and local people and even local ambassadors with the positive stories to give them courage and um, come comfort for the vaccination. And at the same time, we started using insulin syringes because earlier we were using this 2 ml syringe for vaccination, prog uh, vaccination program. But with the use of this insulin syringes, we made two things show that, one, there was not much of a pain at the, because of the injection, and second, it was given only subcutaneously only. It was not at all given uh, intramuscular because that also used to happen and it used to end up in abscess and other complications. And then there was a poor knowledge about vaccination schedule and sessions also. So we, just like our routine immunization programs, the vaccination cards were printed that were distributed in the, to the beneficiaries and one card was also kept at the PSCs and vaccination registries were maintained at the ASHA level. And before the vaccination uh, session, if it's there on the next day, uh, that area used to be, we used to do miking with a vehicle mounted loudspeakers on that area. And we also sent handbills through children to their home so that they will intimate their ch parents, or children, parents or other members of the family to get the vaccine on the very next day. So at the institution level also, we are facing a lot of problems. There is a, a lack of trust even from the uh, staff also about the vaccine because during the uh, outbreak uh, seasons, we used to go for vaccination. And vaccine, obviously, it used to give immunity only two to three months after the vaccination program. And by that time, there used to be so many positive cases, even in the vaccinated people. So there was kind of a lack of trust about the vaccine. And also, uh, our staff, were, they were used to doing the vaccination program 
in their subcenters, in their PSCs. But here in for the K KFD, they used to go for the vaccination at early morning, 6 o'clock, used to visit the most remotest areas, and there were so many other problems also. So we sat with them, we micromanaged their small, small problems, that gap analysis was done at their level, and their confidence was built with multiple training sessions. And there was an issue with uh, the vaccine cold chain also. The vaccine, it's a heat-sensitive vaccine. It should not be frozen. Uh, it has to be maintained in a temperature, temperature of 2 to 4 degrees centigrade. But unfortunately, this vaccine vial doesn't have a vaccine vial monitor. So we were also not sure vaccinating in the dose steps whether we were vaccinating, we are immunizing them properly or not. We are not sure of the cold chain maintenance. So we made sure that as these our health staff were carrying vaccine in the vaccine carrier, uh, the va va ice packs that were there in, the, in those uh, vaccine carriers were changed uh, regularly, at least fourth hourly. And even we asked them to keep a thermometer and keep watching the temperature in those, uh, keep noting the temperature. And there was an issue of uh, storing this vaccine in PSEs also. Uh, our routine immunization, they used their separate ILRs and they were not ready to share uh, their space for this KFD vaccine as it's uh, considered as a uh, patho pathogen level, BSL level 4 pathogen. So we made a uh, 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 separate procurement for ILRs and we made sure this. We clubbed 2-3 uh, PSCs and ILRs were kept in, uh, in a one major uh, PSC and all the vaccines were stored there. So in that way, we tried to maintain cold chain and made sure that the vaccine that we are giving is potent. And we uh, involved private sector also, like we involved uh, uh, local practitioners because they were sometimes kind of a spreading false stories regarding the vaccination, even about the KFD disease also. So involving them actively in, uh, even before your preparatory uh, meetings, interdepartmental inter 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 and inter intersectoral meetings helped us a lot. And one more issue was with the vaccine itself. As I told you earlier, the vaccination the most of the time, it used to start once the once the area started reporting cases. So we started. We used to start the vaccination in that area, and after six to eight months or nine months, sorry, six to eight weeks or uh, ten weeks only, we used to uh, the people used to develop some kind of a immunity. By that time, KFD from December, January, February, the major outbreak, more number of cases are reported in that time only. So even the person who has uh, taken the vaccine will be positive, even if he's taken one dose, two dose. So there was a kind of a lack of trust among uh, people also. Why we should take vaccine? Why we should undergo that pain of taking that vaccine and all those things? So we kind of engaged them in many forums um, uh, through intense IEC and targeted uh, IEC programs. And at the same time, we started uh, promoting other tick, uh, tick repellent and other protect protective measures also in them. And then there was an issue with uh, the time schedule of the vaccination. All these years, vaccination was, used to be done during the month of September and October, the idea was uh, because of the, when the vaccination was started in 1990-91 by Dr. Dandavate, uh, the paper publication says that with two doses of vaccine, it gives immunity of 92%. So if you start the vaccine during, vaccination during the month of September and October, so by the month of November or December, people would have developed a good uh, amount of immunity like 92% as that paper was uh, saying, and the people will be ready for the, the, the immunity in their body. But the recent publication by Dr. Kasibi et al, it, it showed that uh, one dose of vaccine didn't uh, give any immunity. With two doses, immunity levels were around 65%. And with three, uh, the first booster, that is uh, given six to nine months after the second dose, it was around 83%. So we kind of pre pawned all our uh, vaccination activity. We started our vac uh, vaccination activity for the next year from the previous year's May month itself. So May, June, we did the first dose and second dose. And the, the first booster was given either in the month of December or January. So in that way, we made sure that the population was getting good amount of, good amount of immunity also. And we, the challenge of identifying the next hotspot. In KFD, most of the times, as I told you, 11, 12 districts in Karnataka are endemic. They, they'll be reporting cases. We'll be concentrating and we'll be concentrating all our, targeting all our resources into one area, but most of the times, Outbreaks happen in the most unexpected areas. So there is kind of gradual shift in the focus of the outbreak. So we try to not to miss any early warning signals. Because of that, we kind of uh, uh, surveillance system is boosted up very nicely in, the, in, the, in that area. So even uh, from November, even from the October itself, even a single monkey death is reported. We try to conduct post-mortem or necropsy on that, uh, this one and collect the viscera and test for the 
uh, uh, test for the presence of KFDV. Our tick surveillance is also very routinely conducted, and we conduct a lot of intersectoral coordination meetings. With all these efforts, uh, for the, from the year 2014-15 to almost 2017-18, our target was around 90,000. We, our, for the first year, our achievement was only 25 percent. From 2015-16 onwards, uh, our efforts started giving fruits. So it was around 50 percent, 49-46 percent in the year 16 and 17. And in 17-18, uh, it was almost 54 percent. And in year 2018, we had a very big, big outbreak. Our uh, uh, target popular, our target was more than 2 lakh 20 thousand. So we achieved nearly 63 percent uh, percentage coverage during that area. And even this year also, our target is more than 4 lakh 50 thousand for the Shumaga district. We have already vaccinated more than 2 lakh 30 uh, 2 lakh 30 thousand people. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Kiran. I think uh, he's amply underscored the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. There's a huge, sometimes there's a huge gap to go from the lab to the field. And as field epidemiologists, I'm sure all of us understand how we need to be continuously adapting to what the local situation is, how it arises, and what, how we need to adapt the available tools to our situation. So thank you, Dr. Kiran. Well, communications is key during outbreak response preparedness, and it, it can affect what the public reaction is to what the health system is doing. So now if I may invite uh, Ramya to talk about the role of media during outbreaks and uh, in effective risk communications. Hi, uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, thanks to NIE for inviting me. And um, it's an unexpected pleasure to be on the same panel with a legend like Dr. Jacob John. Uh, thanks for that. So um, I'm going to, I, I have a small presentation and um, we should probably take more questions because uh, this is a room of people that all journalists, especially those covering health, would like to be in touch with, would like to speak to. So... Um, So um, what do people like you, what do epidemiologists, what do doctors, what do practitioners see the media as? The media is a tool, but what is its place in an epidemic? Does it even have a role? What do you, what do you guys think? Does media have a role in an epidemic, in covering, in informing the people about health issues? And in your opinion, what do you think the media is? Is it an ally? Is it a partner, an adversary, um, completely unnecessary, or um, a pain in the wrong place? So this is the, I mean, let us assume at this point that the role of the media is not unnecessary. We might be a pain in the wrong place at times, but that makes us, we have, the media now has an essential role in health communication. Um, let's go ahead with that assumption. So what is this media? Today when you talk of media, what do you think? So there are traditional channels, there are traditional newspapers, websites, these are all traditional media. Then there's radio, today there's Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp. So we've already discussed about how it came up during uh, initial conversations about how WhatsApp is not just media, but it's a university with all kinds of multidisciplinary qualifications. So on WhatsApp, you get all kinds of information, all, uh, and, and WhatsApp is this fount of uh, uh, misleading information for anything that is current for any subject under the sun you will get advice on WhatsApp. And today, whether we like it or not, a great percentage of the population is on WhatsApp. And people, for some strange reason, tend to believe WhatsApp. So when you look at the you know, first, the, the, the traditional sources of media, they have shrunk in size, they have shrunk uh, probably in importance or in viewership because of the rise of newer media forms, social media, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, 
which are now providing first line information to the public and it's very interesting to see this classification because as doctors what are you going to use to combat the lies that come out on social media you can't definitely combat every rumor that appears on whatsapp how many rumors are you going to combat in fact you know as journalists we spend a substantial amount of time today trying to confirm rumors that are whatsapp based and believe me it takes so much of time and energy and it's not worth it so as doctors as epidemiologists as leaders in health when you when you cannot combat this pervasive influence of whatsapp it would be meaningless to the areas that you can look at are the traditional channels of course um, institutions have twitter ids they have facebook profiles but also look at newspapers channels websites the ones that you trust the ones that have a reputation for neutrality to take across this information it's easier for you to take across scientific information through a credited uh, uh, you know verified uh, credible newspaper or journal rather than going to um going through this hassle of countering every whatsapp rumor we've heard a lot especially during the corona virus all these you know the um you know whatsapp group is also like a virus it gets activated whenever there's an epidemic so we've heard about all kinds of vague cures what can you take not to contract the infection what can you do to cure yourself all sitting at home so uh, this is one of the things that uh, we need to understand is that we need to do things right so we need to challenge rumors we need to attack rumors we need to attack fake news because fake news spreads if you believe it or not faster than the epidemic faster than a virus um but what do we need to do right so um it's important for people to understand that the media can be your friend it's a good tool especially during an epidemic but unless it's handled well as we've seen it can also be a foe it can be your enemy and some misconceptions that go through the media can be filtered out uh, that go through the to the community can be filtered out by the media but they need to know the facts first as and when they emerge trust rather than secrecy as we've seen in nipa how uh, communication and daily uh, um, you know uh, communication with the media helped to a great deal so everything that can go wrong will go wrong if you don't handle the media well what are the problems that can go wrong misinformation 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 and this arising not it could arise out of uh, malafide intent where people go out with the specific intent of not allowing vaccinations for instance to happen but koshik will have more information on that half truths because people do not understand what they are trying to say very very unscientific evidence um fear mongering lies sheer lies unverified news and then rumors that come on whatsapp masquerading itself on traditional media as well so this can lead to emotional anxiety distress unnecessary panic leading to stigma and discrimination um it leads to people seeking out fake cures and then there's a complacence in prevention because all of us are not following the right uh, protocols it can actually get in the way of public health interventions uh, and impact on communities and the worst case scenario of course we know are deaths so basically as a news person i would say no news is better than fake news but good news is, uh, but factual information would be ideal so what do we need at this point um, for instance cdc uh, has a crisis and emergency risk communication framework it's a protocol for journalists for writers on health and it would communicate uh, during any epidemic it sets out information uh, to journalists it provides public uh, information on a public forum that journalists can access it provides media briefings 
during times of an epidemic, this is a godsend. Um, such a framework doesn't exist in this country or in states. Uh, though we have seen a lot of behavior change communication and awareness building for journalists during the HIV and tuberculosis, um, uh, sort of the, the reign of tuberculosis and HIV, um, there are valuable lessons to learn from this. And I'd probably say that ICMR would be one of the organizations best, played, uh, best placed to play this role. So what is required is training for health journalists primarily. You can't train all. Um, and the journal version of uh, a CME program during epidemics, but also uh, at periodic intervals so that reporters are aware of the latest in public health at least. Periodic briefings during the time of ep epidemic uh, is very crucial, as we've said before. And uh, basically be friends with journalists uh, both ways. It works, uh, it helps each other bo both ways and also helps the community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ramya. Uh, well, a call for friendship. I'm sure all of us are eager to do that. It's, it works both ways. Uh, now I'd like to request Kaushik to uh, share his thoughts uh, on risk communication and how we can improve communications uh, across well, uh, various stakeholders. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, so I have a room full of scientists uh, uh, here, I just want a show of hand to say how many of you, uh, you heard uh, four things, four outbreaks and multiple research. How many of you have even thought about sharing it with media? One, two, three. Okay, don't uh, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, majority hasn't. Uh, why is that? Is there any response I can get? Like, anybody? Yes, so um, that is precisely what I wanted to hear from you. I will keep it very quick because I know I'm standing in between you and your lunch. Uh, so miscommunication only happens when your messaging are not right. And your messaging can only get, you know, corrected if you are precise, concise, and actually consistent. Media requires certain things which Ramya actually um, uh, talked about, but from scientific community, what are you doing and what is um, um, your role? That is something that you need to understand and see how uh, you can actually build communications as a part of your outbreak response. Because all, most of the presentations I saw, your outbreak response didn't even include media. So how, how uh, are we even looking at partnering with media? And honestly speaking, in today's world, information travels and media can only be your friend. And if you cannot actually ally with them, those uh, doubts that you just spoke about um, arise, like miscommunication and misinformation. Um, so we are working, so Global Health Strategies is working with ICMR for last three years, I think, uh, to try improve their communication capacity with media, and I hope uh, we will be, uh, you know, we see a lot of success in that. But um, honestly speaking, I also think that the scientific community, you are the champions, you know what to say. Please, please, there are times when <clears throat> we need to reach out to the media. The other point I just wanted to um, put it across is when you actually reach out to the media, you actually build that trust. Because all I see in all my workshops is uh, there is a huge mistrust between media and the scientific community. Having said that, um, during an outbreak, I would like to leave you with a question, which is like, where do we draw the line being transparent to the public and 
restricting access to information that you could avoid mass panic. So food for thought before you hit the food table. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll start with uh, our audience questions, and we hope that we'll be able to cover most of